So uh, this was a sermon series that I've been working on for a while. Um, And so we're going to start today. I'll just be honest. Some of you may not like me after this sermon series, and I'm okay with that. I plan on stepping on toes. I plan on making you uncomfortable. I plan on making you realize who God is and where does he stand in your life. This has been put heavy on my heart the last couple of months. Um, And then things happened with dad and it got pushed off, which even gave me more resolve knowing that my father on his deathbed denied God. And it made me realize that there are too many people sitting in pews every Sunday thinking they're all good and you're not. So today may be a little hellfire and brimstone. I'm not usually that way, but it has been put heavy on my heart. My question to you is, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Truly, truly, good, good. And I hope you can answer that as firmly as when we read the Bible. Because a lot of people, I believe, sit in pews every Sunday across the world thinking that they are a disciple of Christ, yet they don't know what that even means. So we're going to look at some examples of that coming up. Today I will tell you, and Ryan's uh, communion meditation really kind of lended to this, um, there were times in the last week that, I'll be honest, I didn't feel God. I'll be honest, maybe it was me, maybe I was just beside myself, maybe just trying to figure everything out. But the way I felt God was not feeling him through my prayers, which were lacking, not my reading that was lacking, it was through you. See, I think many times we forget that the disciples of Jesus Christ are how others will feel him, how they will see him how they will understand his love and grace when we are beside ourselves and can't. Your phone calls, your texts, your cards, the people just dropping food off at the house, especially last weekend, Denise had went to see her dad, which is not in good shape. And uh, it was going to be on us to figure out how to cook, and, and I, we can cook. We have mac and cheese. We have hot dogs. We would have eaten but people just wonderfully dropped by food, and it was, it was just amazing. I didn't even know it was going to happen. That's a disciple of Jesus Christ, thinking of someone other than themselves and just doing it. Too many times, even myself in ministry, I'm like, oh, I need to call so-and-so, but it's, is it too late? Is it too early? Are, are they busy? Are, do, and I talk myself out of it, and what I've learned that over the last two weeks is no more will I let Satan put thoughts in my head of going, you know, it's kind of early in the morning. You probably shouldn't text them. If you get a text from me at two o'clock in the morning, it's just know that you were on my heart because I was woke up with a reason to pray. And I will begin doing that. And so I want you to understand that I'm not trying to be a jerk at two o'clock in the morning, but I want you to know that someone is praying for you because for me, that was a blessing to receive those. It truly was. So my question is to you is, are you a Christian? Do you believe in Christianity? Or are you a churchian or believe in churchianity? In other words, if I ask you, uh, are, are you a Christian? And you answer, yes. Praise God for that. And I say, well, give me an example of your Christianity. I go to church. Big deal. Well, I pray once a week. Big deal. I, I help the last 17 VBSs. Big deal. See, all the things that you've done is you've been part of the club. You've been part of the church that's putting on programs. My question to you today truly is, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Yes, going to church, great. Reading your Bible, great. Are you applying what you read? Are you applying what God puts on your heart? Are you a member of him, not just a member of Virgie? And I think too many times we as Christians get confused in, I go to church, so what? That doesn't make you a Christian. 
It doesn't make you a disciple of Jesus Christ. A disciple of Jesus Christ is someone who has given all to him. So are you a disciple? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke 5. We're going to start there. It's interesting to me about, uh, and I don't remember how long ago it was, if you remember when Coke and Pepsi were in a big battle, like who was the number one rated pop, and, or sody, as some of you may say, or sody pop, as some of you may say. And, and Coke was starting to lose, even though it was one of the first pops ever made, and they were losing the, the war, if you will. So they decided to come out with a new Coke. Remember that? It was horrid. It was the nastiest thing you could put in your mouth. Some of you may have liked it. If you did, I'll pray for you. But, but it was, I, I thought it was horrible. And they got, actually, they got death threats. I don't know if you saw that. Um, I was reading articles about this. And they got death threats because they changed what they were doing in order to entice other people. And they had pulled in this company to help them, you know, a, a consulting company. And they're like, if you change the recipe, then you'll, you know, you'll win back these people. And what they found is by changing the recipe, they actually lost thousands and thousands of customers. So after this brainstorm of, well, what do we do now? They realized, let's go back to the old recipe. And people came back. See, my illustration here is we can't change the gospel because the world wants us to. We cannot change being a disciple and giving it all because that's what the world seems to do. All of you sitting in this building today are called apart from the world. When you accepted the, the call of being a disciple, that means you left the world. And now you are in Christ only. Think about that. There's no more an excuse for sin. And you can say, well, we're all human and we all... Yes, we are. But does that give us the right to say, well, I sin, therefore I'm human? Or do you say, I am sinless, therefore I am Christian. I am of Christ. I am a disciple. Sin is no longer allowed in this church. I'm just telling you now. My dad went to hell a week ago. I will not tolerate sin anymore. We have to be called apart from the world. That's what Christ did. Let's look at the example here. Luke 5. Uh, and I thought I set these little things up, and I didn't. So Matthew, Mark, Luke. New Testament. Thank you. I appreciate that. I was struggling with that for a minute. We're going to start in verse 5. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to start in verse 1. Now it uh, happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gerasenet. And he saw two boats at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to push him a little ways from the land. He sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out to the deep water and let down your nets. Simon said, Master, listen, man. Here's the deal. We've been doing this all stinking night. I'm tired. I smell bad. Ain't nothing biting out there tonight or today. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish to their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And when they came, they began to fill the boats and they began to sink. But Simon Peter saw that and he fell down at Jesus' feet and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. At Pentecost, Peter said this, what must you do to be saved? Repent. He is repenting right here. I am a sinful man, Lord. Go away from me. I am not worthy to be in your honor. Have you repented of every sin you've done? Have you repented of every sin you now struggle with? Have you given it to God truly, 
on a daily basis. Take up your cross daily and follow me means to die to yourself that he may live through you. First example is exactly what Peter did. He repented. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish they had taken. And also there were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they had left everything and followed him. If you get anything out of this story, look at the last verse. They left everything and followed him have you given up everything to follow christ or are you so embedded in the world that you have to have see that's where we fail we think we go to church we give an hour out of seven 24-hour days i'm saved I put 50 bucks in the the offering plate this week. I'm saved. Well, I had communion. I'm saved. Those are actions for a servant to a master that does not give you the right to get to heaven. When you give it all to him, now you are a disciple. We are called to be disciples, not butt warmers in a church. And if that's all you think you are, you're welcome to sit here, but I'm not guaranteeing anything. The hardest thing of my dad's funeral was people walking up to me going, well, you know he's in heaven. No. And I told them that. No, I don't know that he is. By the grace of Jesus, if I get up there one day and he's standing there at the pearly gates, I will rejoice and do backflips. Well, cartwheels. No. Somersaults, maybe. (laughs) But the fact of the matter is, the day before my dad died, he wanted nothing to do with God. The Bible is very clear on that. So if you're living your life as a butt warmer in a church and walking out and being in the world the rest six day, six and a half days, six and seven eighths of the days, guess what? You'll be with my dad. And I don't say that proudly. See, it's time we stop playing church. It's time that we step up. We want to know why the world's going to hell in a handbasket? Because we're butt warmers. Nobody wants to step out. Nobody wants to do anything. You come here on Sunday, you listen to me babble for half an hour. You say, great job, Bill, and you walk out like you didn't hear a doggone thing. Well, I'm here to tell you today, either you're with God or you're without God, but being in this building is not the deciding factor. If you have given your heart to God, if you have given your life to God, if you have given everything to God, now we're making progress. Now we're learning what it's like to be a disciple. We cannot play church anymore. We cannot just believe that, oh, the grace of God. Yeah, the grace of God is amazing. It put Jesus on a cross. That's the grace of God. Put his own son there to bleed and die for us. And yet we want to give him an hour a week, 50 bucks in the plate. I don't think we understand the gravity of what Christ did for us on the cross. See, not only did he make us clean, but he made us new. The Great Commission, I bring it up all the time, all authority has been given to me under heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples. It doesn't say go ye therefore and make butt warmers. We could pack the church with a thousand people tomorrow. That's not going to change where they go. It's only when that person accepts, denies themselves, and becomes a follower of Christ. Truly, 100%. I see that all the time on Facebook. Somebody make a comment, dude, 100%, man, 100%. We're in a world that gives 5% at everything. Everybody hates their jobs. I don't. Just throwing that out there. 
but everybody hates their jobs, they don't like the hours, they don't make enough money, they're tired, they're frustrated. Ryan brought up a great example. You have Paul who was beaten often. You have Paul who was imprisoned often. You have Paul who was killed. You have every apostle except for John that was killed, and John they tried to kill. Tried to burn him with the tar and feather type of thing. Didn't work. Why? Because Christ said you will not die like these. God had a different uh, example for him. He would then be sent to Patmos. He would then write the book of Revelation and give us that last prophecy that most of us go, what is that? Only to find that it is probably one of the most incredible books of the Bible. That one day we will witness this happen when we are a disciple of his. If you are not a true disciple of Christ, you don't want to read Revelation. Revelation is a book of terror. Revelation is a book of things that will make you cry in the night if you don't believe in God. But if you do, and if you are truly a disciple and given your life to Christ, truly, 100%, dude, then you will look at Revelation with glee and excitement because Christ is coming home and he's taken us with him for eternity. Eternity. Folks, I can't... I, 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 I don't know what that means. I could probably look at, where's Luke? I could probably ask Luke to find eternity and he would give me some massive scientific thing that my little pee on mine would go, okay, I still don't get. It's eternity. It's forever and ever and ever. Amen. Infinity. It's done. Or you have your choice of going to the other place. So my question again today is, are you a disciple of God? When you accepted Jesus, did you repent of everything? Did you give everything up for the kingdom of Christ? Because if you did not, then you are not. The Bible is clear. Does that mean we all have work to do? Amen. I got work to do. You got work to do. But if we don't start, it won't get finished. And we no longer can be based on the cliche of, well, Jesus loves me, and I'm just full of grace. Because the Bible makes it very clear that his grace is abundant and free and given to those who want it. Now, so let's define that. You can say, I want it all day long. The other day, Denise and I were joking. You know, I'm driving dad's truck, and we were kind of joking around, and we're like, well, you know, eventually I'd like to get a new truck. I've said that before. Not, not that I, I need it, we're blessed, we're, we're, we got good wheels. But someday, I would like to get a new truck. There is a truck at Fieldhouse. So I drove past the other day, and I was just in, it was Wednesday, uh, I had done three funerals last weekend, just before dad came, for other people. My suit was a little gnarly. Had to take it in. I take it to the cleaner. She's like, it'll be ready on Thursday. And I'm like, that's not good. Dad's funeral starts at 8 o'clock Thursday morning. She was wonderful. She goes, I'll put a rush on it. You'll get it Wednesday. So I went. Wednesday picked up. And so I have the suit in the truck. And I'm like, you know, I just, for fun for fun. Drove through Fieldhouse, been looking at this burgundy truck. It's all decked out in black. It's like the fifth or sixth one over. Sharp truck. And I'm thinking in my mind, I can't afford this. It's too much. And then I got out and I looked at the sticker and I thought, I'll never own this truck. It was $73,000. My first house I bought in Delavan, Illinois was $18,000. I'm like, oh, for the love of Pete, man, you've got to be kidding me. $73,000. And then I had to ask myself the question, why do I need this truck? And of course, what did I say? 
it will help me get around when I make calls, when I go visit people. Maybe I can use it to help people move. It's all for the glory of God. And then I realize the selfishness of myself to say, I'm now trying to justify my Christianity to get a $73,000 truck. I don't even know what the payments would be. I would have to be on a mortgage plan of 30 years. But I had to stop and ask myself, why? I think many times we need to do that when we do things. Why am I doing this? Because if we're using God as a cliche to say, oh, I will glorify him when I do this, you need to ask yourself again, but will I? But will I? We forget too often, as Ryan brought up today, again, tremendously, God is always watching. I truly believe that God put it on my heart to say, really, Bill, you're going to use a $73,000 truck for my glory or yours? A true disciple never looks at his own glory. A servant of a master does not look at what do I get out of this? What can I do? But what can I do to glorify my master? We all struggle with it. Satan's cunning. Satan has put my eye on that truck for weeks to the point of actually going to look and then crying. But I have to ask myself, why? Why do I do what I do? Why do I speak? the way I speak? Why do, does my anger get away from me? Why do I, I fly off the handle? Why do I get frustrated? Why do I get angry? And it's because I'm human, right? No, it's because I haven't given it all to Christ. We have to begin to start the walk of a disciple to give it all to God. We need to walk away from it all. And they had brought their nets to, or their boats to land. They left everything and followed him. I bet you no one here has ever been asked to leave their family to go to the missionary field. Would you? Like right now, if the Holy Spirit truly came upon you and said, I need you to go to Mamba Jamba Hoobaloo do. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. But I need you to go to Burma for the next year. Would you walk away from everything you have and go and trust? Do you trust God enough that He would provide for you and your family? See, these are all questions a disciple has to ask. They didn't, they, they met Jesus. 20 minutes before. Maybe they had seen, we don't know, but maybe they had seen him prior to them, him being called the original four. We don't know that. That's reading into the scripture and I don't want to do that. So I know of that right now they saw Jesus and they saw something in a man, not just the fish. That was a great example of like, wow, I didn't catch anything in the last 12 hours. The next thing you know, I have like 4 million pounds of fish. That's awesome. But they heard his teaching and they believed. And Peter fell down at his feet to give everything away. Peter said, I'm not worthy. None of us in this room are worthy to receive the grace of Jesus. But that's why he came for those that are unworthy, that he loves so dearly. Do you feel his love in your life? And if, it, and if you don't, then when was the last time you looked for it? 
When was the last time that you communed with him through his word, through quietness, through prayer? When was the last time that you felt Jesus? A disciple understands that feeling Jesus, knowing Jesus, comes in all sorts of things. I don't have to sit in the sanctuary to feel his presence upon me, which I do many times. There are times that I've sat in this, this sanctuary and not felt a thing. And it's because of this. When you come to the sanctuary, it is not about your feelings. It is not about your like of the songs. It is not your like of my sermons. It is not your like of anything else. When you sit in the sanctuary, it is about you worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When I sit in here, I don't need to feel the feels to feel his presence because I know that he is with me all the time, 24-7, 365. I could be sitting out on the picnic table in the sun and I know he's there. I could be sitting in my office and know he's there. I could be sitting in the van and know he's there. A disciple knows where his master is. And your master is with you all the time. So let's keep going. 1 Timothy 2 says this, uh, verse 3, This is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator also between God and men. That man is Christ Jesus, who gave himself as ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. As a disciple, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, do you understand those words? He desires all men, all women, all people to be saved. That's why Christ came. Now let's take that back to the Great Commission. Go. Jesus didn't look at the, at, the, at the 11 that were left. Judas, of course, was already hanging on a tree. He didn't look at them and say, you guys are fine. You know what, just start a couple churches, have people come in and sit down, build nice cathedrals. It, it's cool. You know, I'm cool with that. No. He said, go. Into all the world, making disciples. And the great part about how he finishes that is, lo, I will be with you even to the end of the age. Christ is in this room now. Not in the four walls of this structure, but in the heart of every disciple that has called upon his name, that has given their life to him, that says, Christ, I will give it all up for you. Romans 14, for not one of us lives for himself, not one of us dies for himself, for if we live, if we, uh, for if we live, we live for the Lord, if we die, we die for the Lord, therefore whatever we, do, we live or die, it is for the Lord, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. Christ died for the world. It is our job to make sure that the world knows it. My job is to make sure that you know it. And you can say, oh, I do. Are you a Christian or are you a churchian? Have you given it all to him? No more I dids. Because it's not about me. What I do is for the glory of God, not my glory. The minute I say I did, then it brings the attention to me. I did not write this sermon series. Christ did. He put it upon my heart. He said, it's time that people hear the truth again. No more lollygagging. Too many are dying. Too many people go to the grave every day that don't know me. Enough is enough. 
It is your job, Pastor Bill, to tell those people sitting there that we all need to be proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone. Go ye therefore into all the world, not just your neighbor's house. He said he denied it, and you said, I quit. It is our job as Christians to change the world. Galatians 2, 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live in the faith by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. If you said, Christ, I do, then it's time to start acting like it. It's time for all of us to get off of our duffs and work for the glory of God in all that we do and say. In all that we, we go, that Christ is first and foremost. We no longer can sit here being, oh, I'm a Christian. Aria, the wide road and the narrow road was a very good story in the Bible. You don't know it, I encourage you to look it up. If you know where your Bible is. Again, I told you I'm stepping on toes today because I'm telling you this, this week has changed my life to say my dad is probably not in heaven. How many people sit in the church that I am the pastor of that will not go to heaven? It is now time for me to step up or step out and tell you what I'm stepping up. My question for you today is will you? Will you step up? Because if you call yourself a disciple of Christ, if you have repented and given it all away for the glory of God, then he has got amazing plans for you. And they're going to stink. They're going to be hard. You will do things that you never wanted to do, but it will be for his glory. And then someday, you will receive yours. But now is the time to work. The fields are full. The laborers are few. What are you going to do? Are you truly going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Or are you going to be a bench warmer? I know what that feels like. I, I think I used that not too long ago in a couple of sermons. I was always the last one picked. I was the ho most horrible at every sport known to mankind. We'd all throw our ball gloves in the middle. Everybody knew my ball glove, and it was always the last one picked. Like, oh, I'll take Bill. Hockey sticks, they were all put in. Everybody knew my hockey stick. Oh, I'll take Bill. Bill, you're the goalie. Just stand there and get hit with pucks. That's why I went out for cross country. N nobody had to rely on me. But what that taught me was, is there is a lonely time in life, and it's called being a Christian. Because Satan's going to be after you, he's going to be hitting you, he's going to be knocking you down. But as a disciple of Christ, I can stand up, I can smile in the devil's face and say, go to hell, Satan, I'm not. It's time to get real, people. It is time to understand that we have a job to do. Bob Goff once said, what if I've, what I've come to learn so far about my faith is Jesus, that is Jesus never asked anyone to play it safe. We were born to be brave. So if I've stepped on your toes today, good. If I've made you mad at me, okay. If I have made you change your heart to become more like Christ, then praise God. Because that's what I want. That's what this sermon series will be about. Is changing your heart and your mind to truly be a disciple of Jesus. Not for yourself, not for the glory of Virgie, not for the glory of anything else. Only the glory of Christ. We have been growing. You want to see a church grow? It's when everybody becomes a minister. Everyone becomes a disciple. And everyone shares the good news of Jesus. 
I don't want people here to warm the seats. I want people here that are wanting Christ 100% in their life. I want them to know their Savior so intimately as Christ knows us. We can change. I would say Virgie, but there's eight houses. We can change Rensselaer. We can change DeMont. We can change Wheatfield. And you never know how far that will go. The apostles started right where they were. And when they were filled with the Spirit, they could not help themselves but to proclaim the good news of Christ everywhere they went. Are you guys that filled with the Holy Spirit that it just can't be held inside of you anymore? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Father, we thank you for your words. We thank you, Father, for, the, for putting this in a book that we can read, a, a book that we can acknowledge, a book that we can learn from. Father, thank you that we have the ability to come before your throne and say, Father, I, I don't get it. and Maybe I don't know what being a disciple is. Father, I pray that you would just place this heavy on all of us. Father, don't let another funeral happen in any of the local funeral homes where a pastor has to get up there and make stuff up about, well, he was a good man and not be able to say this was a Christian man who is now in heaven glorified by your glory. Father, use us to be brave. Use us to be strong for your word, for your son, and for your glory. Father, change our hearts and minds. Change us from the inside out that you would be what we wake up to, what we think about, and what we go to bed to. Father, use us. Keep Satan away from us that we may grow in you, that we may be ready for the battles ahead. And Father, make us your disciples. To the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen.